Welcome to the Shutter. Boy, I can't tell you how good it feels to be back doing this again. I've been away for a while, but I've gotten things squared away and should be posting videos pretty regularly. I've got three great viewer submissions here for you that I think you're really going to enjoy. So get ready and settle in. I used to trail ride in Bankhead Forest. For years, the trails were just numbered 221, 222, and 223. 221 was the longest and least ridden because it was about 30 miles long, depending on just how you rode it. One summer, out of the blue, they changed all trails completely away from the old trail area. That day, I was by myself and thought I would ride the old trail area, even though they had closed and felled trees down for about a half a mile. The trail was very hilly, with lots of bluffs and huge boulders throughout. About nine or ten miles in, my horse, who was well trained as I pinned cows and roped off him, began to toss his head and balk a little. As I came down one side of a hollow to a big creek, he balked completely and would not set foot in the water. My horse was, like I said, well broken, and until then wasn't scared of anything. Across the creek was clear for about 30 feet or so, and the trail went between two boulders. The boulder on the right was house-sized and was against a big oak tree. Then about 8 feet away to the left was another boulder about the size of a tank with the trail right between. Now Jojo, my horse, would dance left or right at that water, but would not cross it at all. I started to really cuss him. I couldn't imagine what might have him so skittish, so I started to really look around, but saw nothing. I was becoming annoyed and was getting ready to really spank him and make him cross when I noticed he wasn't looking forward. He was looking up. I quickly looked up, and about 15 feet up that big oak tree was something standing on a limb right over the trail. I looked at it for what seemed like a long time before my mind could come to grips with what I was seeing. It was a Bigfoot, and it was right over the trail. It didn't move, it just stood still on that limb. I could see its body and face plain as day. Its hair was blowing back from its head and shoulders a little, so I knew it was downwind of us. I didn't smell it, and I don't know how Jojo saw it or smelled it, but he did. Its eyes were down like it was watching Jojo instead of me, but the second they came up to mine, it showed its teeth. I wheeled Jojo around and off we went back up the trail. I heard it hit the ground behind us and for about a half mile or so, I thought he would catch us. I kept looking back and could see it was giving chase. We finally started pulling away. Then, from one look back to the next, it was gone. What bothers me to this day is not knowing if it would have killed me had I not been on Jojo. When I made it back to camp, I told my friend John that had made it to the campsite while I was gone. He saddled up and we went back down the trail. This time, I was armed with my 3030 and 357. When we got close, I had to tie Jojo because he wouldn't go the last half mile. I showed John where it was and even found four or five tracks on the bank going into the creek and out on the other side. While we studied the tracks, rocks started hitting all around us from up the trail, but we couldn't see exactly where they were coming from. So we backed out, got mounted, and raced the ten miles back to camp. From that day on, John would ride the new trails with me, but only if we were armed and he wouldn't stay to camp overnight after that. I still have sleepless nights over this. I just can't get it out of my head sometimes. What if I hadn't noticed Jojo looking up? What if he had stumbled? Sometimes I wake at night still looking for it. To this day, I can't take my glasses off when I sleep. I have to be able to see when I first wake up. I don't know. 
Maybe hearing you tell the story might help. If so, it will be the only thing that has. My maternal grandfather, Daniel, was born in Jefferson County, Florida. He grew up in the Wasica Cody area, hunting, fishing, and roaming the local woods. When, as a teenage boy, he was old enough to go to work, he began working in logging camps which were all deep in the woods. He was an excellent woodsman, hunter, and an expert with firearms. He married my grandmother in 1912 and continued working and living in logging camps until 1929 when his employer, Standard Lumber Company, went broke as a result of the stock market crash and left him and his family stranded in a logging camp in Lafayette County, Florida. When he managed to get his family out of the logging camp, he became a sharecropping farmer in Lafayette County until 1938 when he bought his own farm in Leon County, Florida. He died in 1951 when I was 13 years old. A few months after he passed, I came to live with my grandmother and live with her until I graduated from high school and joined the U.S. Army in 1955. When I was growing up, one of the family stories I heard from my grandmother was about an encounter my grandfather had one night during the years he was sharecropping. This was during the Great Depression and the family was struggling to survive. Their only means of transportation was a mule and a wagon or walking. One night, my grandfather was walking home. It was after dark, but it was a clear night and there was enough light from the moon for him to be able to see the road for a little ways ahead. He was walking along the dirt road in a wooded area that was sparsely populated. There were no houses nearby. When he approached the intersection in the dirt road, he saw what appeared to be a large man standing and silent in the intersection. He couldn't tell if it was a big man or something else. Being a lifelong woodsman and hunter, he was well aware of all the wild animals that lived in that area, including black bears. He was also aware of all domestic animals which, at that time, were allowed to roam free on the open range. But in the darkness, he couldn't identify this person, animal, creature, or object standing there. He knew most, if not all, the men who lived in that area, but didn't know anyone that big. He couldn't pass through the intersection without walking close to the man. It was generally well known in the area that the men of our family would not back down from a confrontation. My grandfather was not a big man, but in that respect, he was very much like the rest of his relatives. Being apprehensive about approaching an unknown person or animal, he stopped about 20 yards short of the intersection and challenged what he thought was a huge man to identify himself. He received no response. After challenging the man several times and receiving no response, he eventually said something to the effect of, Speak now or I will shoot you. After receiving no response, he fired two shots from a Smith & Wesson 38 Special Revolver into the center area of the object. Considering his expertise with this revolver and the close range, it is not likely that he missed his target. After he shot the creature, it moved off into the woods in an upright position without making a sound. After a few minutes, my grandfather continued on his way home. The next morning, he and several others who were well armed went back to the intersection in the daylight to find the creature or at least find its tracks and determine what it was. They did not find the creature, nor did they identify any tracks. No man or animal was ever reported as having been shot or seen at that time and location. Could this have been a bear? Maybe, but there are some things that seem to indicate that it wasn't. Being a woodsman, my grandfather knew what a black bear looked like. Generally, a black bear will run away when approached and verbally challenged by a human. 
It is also very unlikely that a black bear would walk away on his hind legs after being shot twice in the chest by a 38 Special. Normally, in either case, a black bear would run away on all fours. The creature was never identified and the mystery was never solved. Recent stories about people's encounters with Bigfoot type creatures made me remember the story and wonder if that may be what my grandfather encountered back in the 30s. I was born in 1937 and was allowed to start hunting squirrels by myself with a single shot 22 rifle when I was 10 years old. I grew to love turkey and wood duck hunting and occasionally deer until about 2014. In my years of hunting, I sometimes heard sounds in the woods that I could not explain, but never saw an animal or track that I could not identify. Most of the places I hunted had hogs, and I always attributed the sounds to them. I wish I had asked many questions and written down the story back when I first heard it, but I was young and thought I would remember everything forever. My encounter happened 38 years ago, in May of 1982, near a small town in North Carolina named Baden. I was nine years old and hiking with my parents and a few of their friends. We had spent the morning hiking around the woods and trails near Baden Lake, and the adults were enjoying themselves, but being the only person in the group under 30, I had gotten very bored with just walking. In the early afternoon, the group decided to look for a place on a hillside that was supposed to be the site of an American Indian settlement. We had finally stopped for a bite to eat and rest before hiking back to the road. After eating my sandwich, I decided to explore a little and also heed the personal call of nature. I told my mother I was going to find a tall bush which was code speak for needing nature's facilities, so that she would expect me to be out of sight. It wouldn't have been an issue back then as it would be today to let your child get out of sight for a while. I crossed a couple of ravines, big gullies really, with steep sides to put some distance between myself and the group before angling down slope. Nothing too far, if it were a straight line, it might have been 150 yards. I could tell by the slope of the land and the way the trees started to thin that I was nearing one of the narrow service tracks where the Alcoa plant ran their utility trucks. The area was controlled by Alcoa, and the consensus was one of trespassing is prohibited, punishable by arrest and fines. But in practice, it was, as long as you don't tear anything up and we don't catch you, we aren't going to go looking for you. So knowing the importance of not getting caught, I went to the edge of the tree line to select my tall bush. I figured I had done fairly well as I selected a tree to lean against that was at the edge of the woods and also up a steep, cleared slope from the road where I could see anyone coming before they saw me. The slope had only weeds and grass, none taller than knee high, but enough to offer a screen from the road, and a good sturdy tree at my back was as good as any toilet for a wood savvy kid like I was. When I finished, I stood up, and it is at that moment everything went wrong. I suddenly felt weak, then it was as if all my senses but my sight had left me. As I stood there, Without knowing when or how, I was looking into the face of a creature. Down the slope, across the track, and in the edge of the woods stood a giant, hair-covered being just fifty or so feet away. If it had made a sound or had an odor, my brain did not or could not register it. I was frozen. I couldn't move or make a sound. It felt as if any free will I had over myself was gone. I felt sick, weak, confused, and afraid. I was paralyzed, and if anyone or anything had made a sound or movement toward me, I couldn't have done a thing about it. I could only stare at the creature. I couldn't even look away. 
There was an odd, unpleasant feeling in my chest, as if a great weight had been set upon it and was pinning me down. My brain seemed to feel too heavy for my skull, and as if it were unable to command my body. I could only stare. I couldn't even make a sound as it stared back. It was so unfamiliar, nothing I had ever seen, human or animal, could describe it. The body was massive, covered in hair that was a dulled black, with a lighter quality over it, almost like the black of charcoal with some ash on it. The hair was longer in some places and varied in thickness, but some spots over the torso and abdomen were clumped together as if an oily or wet substance was sticking them together. The skin underneath was a dark grayish black, lighter than the hair, but not by much. There was no hair around its eyes, nose, or lips, but a thin long layer on the cheeks and down the jawline and under the mouth. Its eyes were dark, black looking, and deep set, but close together, and it had a thick, heavy brow, but nothing that resembled eyebrows as humans have. It sloped back into the hair covering its head. Its nose was large, but like a human's, with pinkish red color showing in its nostrils. The mouth was broad with thin lips, but again almost shapeless, just a crevice across its face. The jaw was long and heavy looking. Hair obscured most of the jaw and area beside and below the mouth. I could not see a chin. It didn't seem to have a neck. The huge head looked to be stuck on the body between two massive shoulders, with a slight point to it that could have been obscured by hair because this is where the hair seemed thickest. There seemed to be a mass of something, hair, flesh, or something else that made it look like it had a lump of hair behind its head tapering down to its shoulders. The creature was wider than two large men and thick of body and limbs. Its arms draped at its sides and were long, but I couldn't say what the hands looked like in great detail. I was transfixed on its face. I don't recall that I looked lower because I have no memory of lower legs or feet or maybe my view was obstructed. I do remember that it was a male though. It was very tall. I was in no frame of mind then to guess how tall, but in retrospect I'd say taller than eight feet and probably four or more feet wide at the shoulders. The only part it moved was its lips. It never opened its mouth never blinked, never swayed or ducked. It just stood there as still as I, looking at me while its lips moved slightly as if it were sucking on something or puckering them slightly. Then it stepped backwards into the brush and disappeared. No noise, only a slight movement of leaves and a dark fading shadow until it was gone. Suddenly, I began to feel my senses return. First my hearing, which was more of realizing I was hearing nothing but my own shallow breathing than my pounding heart. All at once, I could move and then think again. I was making a weird sound deep in my throat, like I wanted to scream, but my throat wouldn't obey. I was shaking and tears were on my face. I immediately threw up my bologna sandwich, then struggled to run away. I still felt weak and heavy out of breath and disoriented. Just moving seemed a monumental task. I was clumsy and having difficulty making my way back to the adults. I don't remember that part clearly, other than being absolutely certain this thing was going to get me. I told my mother that a giant, hairy, naked man in the woods had watched me pee, embarrassing her in front of her friends and colleagues, who all chuckled. She laughed, then scolded me, saying that I was making up stories because I was bored. I never said another word to her about it. That whole experience changed me in many ways. I had always enjoyed being outside and in the woods. It was a long time before I could enjoy that again, or bear being near a window after dark. I carry the fear from that day still. 
I had never heard of Bigfoot or Sasquatch. I had no frame of reference for what I had seen except the Wolfman, so in my child's mind, that's what it became. That human but not human, animal but not animal thing. I believe for some time after that, this creature spent some of its time as a human man, and all the stories were wrong about the full moon. I experienced anxiety and panic attacks for the first time in my life. I didn't know what was happening to me. I just associated the feelings with that creature, and still being a kid enough to think on kid terms, I would promise myself and it and the Lord that if this creature wouldn't come for me, I'd never tell anyone about his secret. I made that sentiment a part of my daily prayer and believed it was all that kept me safe. I finally got a hold of some Time Life books in the library at school, and in them I read about the giant, hairy Sasquatch and thought, maybe. But no, that was in California. I was in North Carolina, so not likely. Over the years, I got a little peace back, but still, my mantra of never telling was what I believed kept me safe. The entirety of the encounter was no longer than 10 seconds, but it has lasted 38 years. I still succumb to the panic occasionally, usually in nightmares where it returns to finally get me. I still say to it that I promise not to tell. I have suffered a lot from my experience, but that is a whole different rabbit hole. The only people I've ever told in any depth is my husband and children, and even then, not as much as I've shared with you here. I don't really talk about it, and I've only mentioned it a handful of times, and then only if asked directly. I'm telling you now, and it's not without a sense of betrayal to my mantra, but I believe sir, that you, among a few, do understand my feelings. I won't say that I'm not afraid even now, and I will without a doubt have a nightmare which happens every time I dwell in that memory, but I also need peace. I don't want to harbor its secret anymore. Wow, three great stories, and I really hope you enjoyed them as much as I enjoyed telling them. Uh, I really want to say thank you to everyone that sent those in. That is greatly appreciated. Uh, if you want to send your story in, you can send it to readmynarrative at gmail.com. You can find that in the description. And uh, thank you all so much for listening. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Make sure you hit that notification bell so you can join me here next time for The Shutter.